welcome back to the Forge of Sagas, and today I wanted to have a discussion about how I approach terrain and the things I like to keep in mind when designing and assembling my pieces. After we finish the philosophy discussion, I'll be announcing a new series where we're going to put those ideas into practice, and take you from building just a starter set of terrain to a full-sized board. So without further ado, let's go Behind the Craft. When it comes to building terrain, there are three concepts I like to keep in mind as I go through my process, whether I'm doing it for an RPG like D&D, or for wargaming such as Warhammer 40,000. In my opinion, terrain should be important, interactive, and intuitive. These three things help maintain the playability and functionality of the build. Now, I want to put a caveat in here and say that I have nothing against people who build dioramas. Dioramas are amazing, and a lot of times I watch those kinds of videos and look at what people do to inspire myself to build things. However, there are dioramas that are meant to be static scenes. They're not designed always for functionality. So, in this video, keep that in mind as we get deeper into these three individual ideas. The first eye is important, and this helps me decide whether I'm actually going to build a project or not. There are so many cool things that I could build, but like the rest of you, I'm sure, I only have so much hobby time. So I need to prioritize things that are going to give me a lot of value for myself and my players. So to be important, a piece of terrain must have an effect on gameplay. Now, in an RPG context, this means that it likely represents a significant encounter. This could be something in combat where you've got a big boss room and they're going to have to use the terrain to manipulate it, hide from the boss, use it to attack. Or it could be a time trap, something like that initial temple from Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, where there's a lot of things that are going to reflect on the position of your player's models. Now, these things are going to be visualized a lot better if you can put something on the table that lets the players know exactly where they are. And for something with a complex mechanism, you know, it might help them to really visualize it better than if you just drew it on a mat and say, okay, the lever is over here, and then, you know, you've got to run over to this thing, and all that other stuff that you would get in a scenario. When it comes to wargaming, things are a lot simpler because terrain pieces have associated rules. So when you're building something to be important for wargaming, make sure it has some rules. Does it give you cover? Does it give you minus one to hit? Does it slow down your movement? Does it block line of sight? That's a rule. Or, you know, depending on your game system, it might have some more specific rule. I know there's a lot of that stuff for smaller games like Necromunda, where you can fall into chemical vats and all kinds of stuff. But those are the kinds of things you're going to want to keep in mind as you're deciding whether this is an important piece of terrain for you to build and whether you're going to get any value out of it. The second principle we're going to talk about is making sure your terrain is interactive. You can build the most beautiful scenery in the world, but if models can't do anything with it, then what you've created is a lovely table decoration, a nice paperweight. Now, this has a lot of value in and of itself, and if that's what you're going for, that's cool. But here on this channel, I'm really focusing on creating functional terrain that will do something for you. So for terrain to be interactive, models have to be able to engage with it in a meaningful way. Now, the first rule of this is no wobbly model syndrome. Models should always be able to sit flat on the terrain piece, or at least in such a way that they don't tip over at the slightest breeze. This is something you really want to avoid, and something I always try to do by keeping a model on hand in order to make sure that when I'm creating walkways or little steps, that they're the right size. Now, when we want to look at things to make interactive for RPGs, we can talk about mission objectives. You know, there's a treasure chest they need to steal, there's crystals, there's things to destroy, you know, maybe dragon eggs. They've got to steal or destroy the eggs so that there aren't more dragons. These are great things to build. These are going to provide you with something they can engage with. You know, traps as well. Traps are amazing because traps are very interactive. The players can fall into them. The players can then repurpose them and use them against their enemies when they're running out of the dungeon with whatever they've got their grubby little hands on. Again, I'm going to go back to Raiders of the Lost Ark because there's so many things in that intro sequence that relates to terrain building. All of those different traps are synchronized and they're all very interactive because the players can use them against their enemies and they force the players to do a lot, so there are many ways for the models to engage with that kind of terrain. Now, when we flip over to the wargaming side, I want to talk more about match play and kind of more competitive-esque gaming than I will about narrative play. Narrative play is going to function a lot like an RPG because you're going to be creating those narrative objectives and you can build them into your terrain. But when we're doing wargaming for the sake of wargaming and playing something like Warhammer 40k in a matched play game, we want to make sure that there are two things we really respect. One is the average movement of a unit. 
If you're making vertical terrain, this is especially an important problem that I dealt with in the Demonic Smelter, you know, you have to know how far things can go without having to do something else. Looking at the Demonic Smelter, we can put my speed square up to the model and we can see that this is about 6 inches tall. Now, the average movement speed of a Warhammer 40k infantry model is 6 inches, so there was no way they were going to get up there without an advanced move. And that's the only reason I built this staircase in the first place. The other thing you want to consider is the average squad size. Because you want to make sure that whatever unit you have can actually benefit from the terrain. You know, can I get this unit of snipers up into this sniper's nest that I've built? Can my unit of assault intercessors or guard infantry fit behind this wall and take advantage of cover or, you know, blocking line of sight? These are kind of the measurements you need to think about, and again, why it's great to have models on hand while you're building, to make sure that your terrain actually does the rule thing that you want it to represent. So the last of the three eyes is intuitive. And this means that players should be able to look at a piece of terrain and understand what it does. You don't want to spend half an hour explaining to your players in an RPG, I know it looks like this, but in actuality it works a different way than you would think, or arguing with your opponent in a war game over whether something provides cover or minus one to hit or whatever other rules fit your system. It takes away from the time you spend playing and it kind of robs you of the immersion. So for me, for terrain to be intuitive, the way models engage with the terrain should make logical sense. And there are two main things that apply no matter what setting you're doing it in. You should have good passive movement and causality. Passive movement are just how you move around the terrain. That means, you know, oh, there are ladders, I guess I go up the ladders, or there's stairs, well, we'll take the stairs to go up. There's just easy ways for players to look and say, this is how I'm supposed to move around the terrain where I can be or can't be. The other thing is causality. We want to have cause and effect relationships that make sense. You want to say, oh, you know, again, Indiana Jones, it's a great example. When that boulder comes rolling at you, it shouldn't be rolling uphill. The train should make it look, at least give the appearance if it doesn't actually do this, that the boulder is rolling downhill towards the players. These kinds of cause and effect relationships give the players a lot of sense of fairness that, yeah, we should have seen that coming. That's on us, and it creates, again, a layer of immersion that makes sense to them as they try and work through your puzzles. Now, again, we want to talk about traps. Traps are great. And here, when we say intuitive, I do not mean obvious. A trap can be devious. Look at this trap, the Leap of Faith trap. I love this trap. I like to use it every once in a while to get my players, because they're like, is it the Leap of Faith trap, or is it just a regular pit trap? oh crap, we don't know, and then they panic, and then usually I do something to them because they've been waiting there that long and there's a third trap, and that's how I get them. But, you know, how it functions is intuitive. Once they've sprung the trap and it's got them, it's like, all right, that made sense. We're not happy. We're very not happy, but we understand what happened, and that's what I mean by intuitive. Now, in wargaming, that means that the terrain, the way you put it on the field, should be very obvious what rule it means. If this thing is designed to give a cover save, like, you know, a bunch of sandbags, yeah, that provides a cover save. If it's a bunch of trees and they're thin and sticky, probably not giving you that cover save. But, you know, in Warhammer 9th edition, that's a great way to gain dense cover, a minus one to hit, you know, what we might call concealment. You know, if it blocks line of sight, the thing should really block line of sight. These are just, they're simple things, and I know that, but you'd be amazed, you know, sometimes when you're just working through a party and you're like, oh, this is really cool, this is really great, this is what it's going to be, and then suddenly you get ahead of yourself, like, oh, I put all these holes in my line of sight blocking terrain, and it doesn't block line of sight anymore. Or, hmm, maybe this isn't as clear as I thought it was. So, again, we want to make sure that things are intuitive because it keeps us immersed, keeps the game going, and lets us play our games. So, that wraps up the three eyes of terrain. So now let's get on to putting those into practice. So now that our philosophy lesson is over, it's time to talk about putting those ideas into practice. Now, I was at the goodwill when inspiration struck and you know, sometimes you've just gotta follow it. All right, let's see what we've got here. Today's haul, we've got these Beyblade arenas. Eh, I could do something with this. This one's got a nice square shape. You know, maybe, maybe I can make these into bunkers. Yeah, bunkers sound nice. You know, this one, I got this blue one. Wait, 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 red, blue, red, blue, red. I know this is actually orange, but go with me on this. Oh, it's time.
And what can I say? Sometimes inspiration strikes and you have no choice but to take it and run with it. So for your wargaming pleasure, we are going to be building Blood Gulch Outpost number one. Now to start, we're going to be doing a skirmish sized terrain set. This is great for anyone just getting into the hobby. You know, you've got your start collecting box or any of your other intro sets. And you just want to try it out, you know, get your models on the tabletop and start playing. So these will be relatively simple builds. You know, we'll do some barricades, we'll do some trees, some rocks, and I will be building one of the vehicles from the series. So I haven't picked which one I'll be doing yet. So you can feel free to leave a comment below and decide, do you want me to do Sheila as the tank? Sheila when she becomes the ship? Maybe the ghost? Or, you know, maybe the puma? Warthog. It's the warthog. Apparently it has tusks. Oh well. So, leave a comment below as to which vehicle you'd like to see me build at the end of this particular part of our series. Also, subscribe to the channel so you can keep up to date not only on this project, but all the other terrain pieces and kit bashes that we love to do here at the Forge of Sagas. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you learned something that's going to help you build your own terrain pieces. And I hope to see you all again the next time we ignite the Forge of Sagas.